Changing gears once again, uh, our next speaker is Greg Moore, who is a real slacker. Uh, he is an engineer, a practicing neuroradiologist, an uh, informaticist, and an innovator who is leading the healthcare vertical for Google Cloud. His team works with other Google teams and Alphabet companies to use AI and machine learning techniques to try to develop new products that will improve the quality of healthcare, um, both quality, delivery, and access on a global level. So please help me in, uh, welcome Greg Moore and for his talk, Medical Imaging, Big Data, and Machine Learning, a Google and Global Perspective. Delighted to be here today. Um, thank you, Natalie, for the introduction, and thanks to Kurt for the invitation to come speak. Delighted to be here to offer you a, both a Google and a global perspective on medical imaging, big data, and machine learning. Medical imaging, in particular radiology, has transformed the way that medicine makes diagnoses. So whether it's x-rays, ultrasounds, MRIs, CT scans, PET imaging, this has undergone a completely analog to digital transformation over the past two decades, leaving us with a tremendous amount of data. So the outline for my talk is here. I'm going to show you that I think you're already convinced that medical imaging is big data. Just talk a little bit about how that is stored. To highlight that radiology is really at human limits at this point, and, and then to, to talk about how machine learning might enable access to places um, that, that is, we even heard earlier from our speakers that uh, to provide access to medical imaging interpretation where it's not available, to highlight the global scarcity of trained physicians to interpret medical images, and, and to really explore how the successful application of machine learning may have transformational access and quality enhancing implications across the globe. So how big is medical imaging data? The best that we can tell, it's about two trillion images per year generated globally, just under half of those in the US. That translates to approximately 450 petabytes per year. That has been doubling historically about every five years, although in recent years we've seen that accelerate. For medical legal reasons, these images must be stored for five to 25 years, on average about 10 years. That translates to about 4.5 exabytes of medical imaging data for radiology alone um, globally. So this data is typically stored or siloed in, in radiology in uh, what we call PACS system, picture archiving and communication systems. It's helpful that this is generally in a standardized format called DICOM. And in many systems, we have access to longitudinal data and the ability to correlate this with electronic health records and other um, things like pathology. Um, there are standardized mechanisms for researchers to access this data through IRBs and in transparent, uh, in transparent ways. It's been questioned by the research community how useful um, these clinical imaging archives are for um, research. My former uh, team, before I joined Google and I, uh, just recently um, explored this um, before I came. And uh, this is hot off the press, is actually just the head of print in radiology. This is last month. It's the first time I'm talking about this. We explored this question in patients undergoing evaluation for seizure disorders. They had both research grade imaging, thin slice MRI of the brain, as well as clinical grade imaging, so thicker slice images of the brain at the same time. And I'm not asking you to read those axes there, but you can see for standard things like gray matter volume, white matter volume, very tightly correlated along that diagonal between um, clinical grade and research grade images. But what really surprised us is in, in, in all those areas of red in the brain, even for those finer grain structures, very tight correlations between clinical grade imaging and research grade imaging, suggesting that these large clinical archives, of, at least for brain imaging data, may have incredible utility for research applications, including ML. So opening up in a wide swath of data um, for investigation. I want to highlight that radiology um, is approaching human limits. So as a modern cross-sectional radiologist in interpreting MRI or CT scans on any given day, a radiologist will take care of about 50 patients interpreting their studies. Each of those um, studies have numerous images associated with them. A simple study on the order of 100, a complex study could go up to about 1,200 images. On average, about 400 images. Um, 
If you add that up in a typical nine hour day, there's uh, over radiologists interpreting uh, images, there's about 32,400 seconds. It's about 20,000 images. It's about 1.5 seconds to evaluate those images. So the only way to scale this um, in a traditional manner is actually to have more radiologists. In the US, we're blessed to have many radiologists in many of the developed world, but that's not the case globally in terms of scaling. So we need to begin, I would advocate, to begin looking at other ways to scale this. Um, I have the immense privilege to, uh, to be at Google, and, and we're an AI-first um, um, company. Um, TensorFlow is our, our platform for machine learning. Uh, we, uh, Google made an incredible decision to open source that, that, that back in 2015, and has seen tremendous uptake in the developer community from, from 2015 onward of the uptake of TensorFlow for machine learning applications. This is open source so that it becomes a platform for everyone, just not at Google. And again, no matter how you um, look at this, um, this, again, tremendous uptake, for instance, over 7,000 GitHub repositories with TensorFlow um, available at this time. Google's first uh, endeavor to use machine learning in the area of medical imaging, again, radiology is just one area. It was in the area of diabetic retinopathy. You've heard us talk about um, this before, but an incredible project from the Google Brain team, who are my close collaborators. Um, here, they actually pursued this area again, addressing the need in, in the developing world. So diabetic retinopathy, the fastest growing cause of blindness, um, again, with a burden of that in the developing world. In India alone, uh, there's a shortage of 127,000 ophthalmologists, eye doctors, to evaluate um, these images. So this is just one area of the world. 45% of patients suffer blindness before a diagnosis in a very treatable disease. So this is certainly an area that ML may be used to create access. Um, diabetic retinopathy is diagnosed just by a fairly simple um, image of the, of the retina ingraded and looking for these splotches or their hemorrhage that's, that indicate diabetic retinopathy. Um, Google team, the Google Brain team, trained a neural network with TensorFlow um, to uh, read these fundus images together with a large panel of pathologists to create a gold standard. As you'd expect, um, us doctors all often have opinions that differ, so we needed a, a group, a panel of, of physicians to actually establish uh, a, a, a gold standard. Um, and just to cut to the incredible results that the Google Brain uh, team is, they were able to develop an algorithm to, di to, to evaluate and diagnose diagnostic retinopathy on par with human performance um, with, the, with the study. So an incredible way to, um, again, provide access, we, we would hope, in the developing world to, to extend this technology and apply it. More recently, and this is work that the Google Brain team has just recently um, begun discussing, is applying machine learning to detect breast um, cancer metastases in lymph nodes. Preprint of this is available and, and it's talked on the blog site. Um, so um, they've, they've set about training algorithms to actually detect breast cancer metastases. And the preliminary results in this, like diabetic retinopathy, are very encouraging um, to be able to identify cancers on pathology slides. Again, similar to diabetic retinopathy, on par or even exceeding human performance in this area for this particular application. Again, massive shortage of trained pathologists to evaluate biopsies the, across the world. There's tremendous opportunities ahead in this space, not only for imaging, but to join it with other types of data. Uh, we've talked about pathology and, and medical images today, but uh, to join um, the, these um, algorithms with genetic data as well as electronic health records in, attempt to pre pre in, the, in the attempt to uh, predict outcomes and treatment response. So really encouraged about the growth of this field across the ecosystem. AI and medical imaging landscape is growing tremendously, both with large companies and dozens and dozens of startups, just a few listed here. Um, you'll hear the tremendous work of Arteris uh, following me in the area of cardiology. So it's just really gratifying to see this landscape developing um, for the benefit of patients. I want to shift here uh, as, I, as I wrap up to share a global perspective on imaging. It's a story of scarcity and medical error. So two-thirds of the world's population lack access to medical imaging interpretation. 
two thirds according to, to who. According to the American College of Radiology, four billion individuals in, in, uh, in across the world live in radiology scarce zones without the ability to acquire or interpret those, those images. So a tremendous global scarcity. At the same time, um, the best data that we have is over 43 million people are affected significantly by medical error across the world with the greatest burden of this in the developing world. So this is a story that um, we would we'd hope is our vision, our, our challenge, our hope is that the use of machine learning algorithms, the building of these algorithms by us, by the entire ecosystem community can bring um, life changing, life saving medical diagnosis um, to 4 billion people in millions of villages just like this across the world in a scalable way um, via the cloud. And so I'd, I'd hope and I'd ask that you all, some of you not only to support that vision, but actually go on that journey together with us in the area of machine learning. Um, I'm privileged here to present the work of hundreds of individuals who I collaborate with. I want to thank you for your time and attention.